perspective from multiple lenses, especially because we hear from both voices throughout the book. Now, one of the other things that's really exciting for me as a pop culture person, and I love, uh, I'm a pop culture junkie, I would say, is that this really gives kind of a backstory into the origin of Great Big C. And I have to admit, I don't know, too, I didn't know too much about the band before moving to the island, but this book really gave me that VH1 behind the music experience um, around how everything kind of been played out from the way they got together to the way they eventually kind of disbanded. And I think that historical significance and that knowledge was really useful to me as somebody who's not too familiar with the music scene here. It also kind of carried you through various scenes of St. John's history and, and Newfoundland history for that matter and the presence of religion and um, how much power the Catholic Church had here in this province. So it really gave you the most bang for your buck I would say uh, on the most basic level but it explored some really heavy issues and really rooted in these honest experiences of these characters and, and being a memoir, being nonfiction, really added that value. Uh, now I want to share one of the quotes uh, from the book and, and I will say when I, when I first got into it I wasn't sure what to expect but uh, it was interesting how how it would take you on these highs and lows throughout. And I want to share this this one scene, and I don't want to give too much context to it because I, I do want to encourage you to get out and read the book. Um, but it starts here. One might think this bizarre and highly legal episode would expose the cleric as the very dangerous offender that he really was, but no. Instead, the ire, instead of ire and indignation, all he drew from his faithful followers, my parents included, was pity and concern. When we walked into his private room, filled with get well cards and bouquets of fresh, flower, fresh cut flowers, the priest had a huge smile on his face. I remember silently standing at the foot of his bed, staring at his feet while dad made small talk and mom fussed over him. While he lay there soaking up their attention, I heard him call my name. Sean, come closer and give this poor priest a hug. I could feel my face turning red as I looked up slowly at the face of my abuser, to, the, to face my abuser. His arms were open, waiting for my embrace, and my parents' eyes were on me, waiting for me to offer it. Time stopped, and for a split second, I felt like the truth would come falling out of me like rain. But I still wasn't ready for the truth, and all that fell were tears. Without saying a word, I turned around and walked out of the hospital and back home. My parents assumed that I had been emotionally overwhelmed by my deep sympathy for my stricken friend, and I lacked the courage to correct them. That is uh, uh, page, I think, 65. So you're barely really getting into the book. You're just starting to get into the book, and so much has happened already, but so much is about to happen. And I think that moment of release of feelings is really significant, and it just really captures... Um, a moment and a scene that really kind of plays out in different ways throughout the book. So I hope that taste kind of gave you something to look forward to. And for me, I think that scene also brought up a lot of emotions, as most of the book did, because it really took you through these sad spaces, happy spaces, intense feelings, and it was a roller coaster because you were see you were getting invested in these characters because each chapter had a different voice being presented. Right? You had Andrea, and then you had Sean, and you really got to intimately know these characters and what they were going through. So when they experienced something, you really felt it. And I think one thing that I have never seen in a book was the the use of song lyrics and drawings throughout. It was kind of like a built-in soundtrack that, you know, as you were going through the scenes, you'd see uh, these drawings kind of cap off a chapter. So like this one says, goodbye, old friend. And it's it's just these beautiful drawings accompanied with song lyrics. And it's, it's a built-in soundtrack. I, I don't know how else to explain it. So it offered a lot of excitement throughout. And you really got to get... Um, kind of various themes and experiences explored um, in, in one book. So I want to encourage everyone out there to, to take a look at this book. One good reason, I, I think I gave you like at least 15 there, uh, reasons to check it out. It is One Good Reason by Sean McCann and Andrea Aragon. In the Stacks with Julia and Christina from the Newfoundland and Labrador Public Libraries. Hi, my name is Julia. Christina and I are library technicians, co-workers, and friends. We love books and love talking about books. 
we wanted to share one of our book chats with you. So to start with, um, we're going to share, uh, take turns telling about books that we are currently reading or have just read or maybe are rereading. So the first book um, we're going to talk about today is called Dust and Shadow. And it is by Lindsay Fay. It's an account of the Ripper killings by Dr. John H. Watson. So, yes, you are correct. That is the John H. Watson, who is the sidekick of Sherlock Holmes. So it combines two of the fa my favorite things. I like Jack the Ripper-esque uh, kind of uh, mysteries, and I love Sherlock Holmes. So it combines two of those things that I really, really like. Um, and yes, the it author, does. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> so uh, the author does a really good um, job at recreating the kind of feeling of a Sherlock Holmes book. So I, I found a little passage here that I wanted to share with you, and it goes like this. It's Dr. Watson explaining something. The following Monday, I returned from a game of billiards at my club to a curious spectacle in our sitting room. Holmes was stretched out upon the settee, feet propped on its arm, and head supported by pillows. With the neck of his violin wedged into the cloth of his sling and his left hand scraping the eerie, vagrant chords, which I associated with his most melancholic level of meditation. I made from my bedroom, or his more abstract musical efforts were keenly disquieting, disquietening to my nerves, and I did not relish hearing them played left-handed. But he stopped me with a question. So, um... <laughs> I love yes, the way I, you finish that. I want to know what question he asked. Oh, oh, <laughs> the question is, and how is your friend Thurston? I turned to regard Holmes with the expression of utter bewilderment. How did you know I was with Thurston? Uh, so, again, you know, Holmes doing his Holmes thing, like finding, like, I don't know, a grain of sand on his lapel and said, okay, you were at the beach. But, I'm like, yeah, you know, he does, he does the Sherlock Holmes thing. It's what he does. So, uh, the book is full of Holmes being Holmes and uh, Watson being his faithful sidekick. But they are um, on the trail of Jack the Ripper. And it's a really good book. It sounds good. So now it's your turn, Christina. What are you reading? I am reading a book called The Coroner's Daughter um, by Andrew Hughes. Um, and the the book takes place in Dublin in um, 1816. Um, so it's, you know, the, the 1800s um, when women were not supposed to be interested in certain things. They were supposed to um, basically just get married and, you know, have children and, and, and not be interested in um, a career or interested in certain subjects, that kind of thing. Um, so we're in that time period. And the author does a really good job of, of bringing that time period to life. Um, but the main character is, um, as the title says, the coroner's daughter. So her father is the coroner um, in Dublin. And so he um, works a lot um, with the police and with inquests um, into um, murders and suspicious deaths. Um, and she has a great interest in his work. She's really, she's really inquisitive and she's really smart. Um, and she is really um, definitely not a woman of her time, we'll say. The people around her, her friends, her father, um, her father's assistant, they accept her as she is. They don't, they don't try um, and force her to be something that she's not. Um, their only interest in getting her to kind of conform to society's ideas is for her own safety, um, because they know that allowing her to pursue certain things and certain interests could ruin her reputation. The first sentence, I'm going to read the very first sentence because it's a perfect introduction to her character. And this is, this is the very first chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> for my 18th birthday father promised me the hand of a handsome young man which he duly delivered mounted in a glass bell jar 
That's gruesome. <laughs> right? So there you go. There's a, there's a good introduction. That was her birthday present. <laughs> Happy birthday. Here's a dismembered hand. Yes. <laughs> now, Christina, you and I did not compare books at all. No. <laughs> we did we not. at all. So this is really weird because the next book that I have is about a girl who's doing something that at the time she shouldn't have wanted to be doing. Right. So the name of this book is called uh, Deadly Curious by Cindy Anstey. It's in the e-library. But it's like reminiscent of a Jane Austen um, novel with a dash of murder thrown in. Ooh. Exactly. So my character is named Sophia, and she wants to be a Bow Street runner. What's a Bow Street runner? So a Bow Street runner is a... Kind of like a plainclothes detective during the Victorian times. So they primarily were there to do, um, like, investigate robberies and that kind of thing. They would investigate murders or whatever, but it was primarily um, robberies and, like, vagrancy and that kind of thing. They would go around and they would um, track people down. So that was their job was to track people down that the law was after. So they were a little bit like a bounty hunter, but more like a plainclothes detective. So that's what she wants to be. And uh, she is really determined to be a uh, Bow Street runner. She knows that she's smart. She's very, again, like your character, very inquisitive, very smart. Um, and her cousin, Daphne, who is very dramatic, um, sends her this very dramatic letter explaining to her that um, something dastardly is going on and that she must come to the manor house to help her figure out, you know, what it is. And I think one of their cousins um, is accused of murder and she has to help. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm just getting started with it and it's really good. So <laughs> like when you're describing your book and I'm thinking, we didn't, yeah, we didn't talk about this, did we? We no. did not. Did not talk we about did not. No. Sometimes we <laughs> get in inside I each other. Say, uh, sometimes. One thing about the coroner's daughter is that it's not like an edge of your seat thriller. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they pick up mystery novels, they, they expect like edge of your seat um, thrillers because that's a big trend in a lot of, a lot of mystery novels these days. But um, this one is very much um, kind of a slow build with the mystery and uh, and I know you enjoy mysteries like that um yeah you, you have that common um and so uh yeah but it's uh it's definitely a slow build and the two that you've described are sound similar so this one the deadly curious is more of a romance with a little bit of mystery thrown in it's uh so she she falls in love with uh the police constable and um tries to help him solve the crime and but it it is very Jane Austeny. So that made me think of you. <laughs> I do love so, a good Jane Austen. <laughs> but it, it is a little bit of fluff. It's a little bit fluffy, and that's okay. Sometimes you need a little bit of fluff. You do. Exactly. I agree. Yeah, sometimes you just need the fluff. So what's your next book? My next book is something that is, um, I wouldn't say fluffy, but it's definitely more of a, of a, um, of a romp. <laughs> I'm going to call it a romp. It's, um, it's, a, it's a fantasy book. And what the author does is she took Christian doctrine, um, Christian mythology, um, and also Norse and Greek mythology. And she built a fantasy world around those ideas and those um, beliefs and philosophies. Um, and so there's not a lot of world building involved. Um, she has this kind of idea... Um, that the reader already knows enough about those worlds that they don't need her to kind of go in and explain it all. So there's not a lot of um, world building involved. You can just enter right into the story. Um, it's called The Library of the Unwritten by A.J. Hackwith. Um, and I found it, I was just, I was in the mood for something fun, something easy, um, something that would just kind of, you know, get me, get me going. Um, and I was scrolling through Libby, um, and I stumbled across this and I was like, you know, that sounds like it might fit the bill. So let's give it a try. 
Um, and it totally did. It's just, it's a fun, easy, um, really easy to get into, um, really easy to kind of um, follow along with, um, but it's super fun. So the concept is that hell, um, the Christian hell that you think about, run by Lucifer, um, he has a library in hell where all of the... As you would. Un- as you would, right? As you would. Yeah. Um, um, that sounds like a fun library for me to visit. <laughs> <laughs> so long as we don't have to work there, that's okay. Right? Um, yeah. And so in this library, um, it had the only books that it has on its shelves are books that have been unfinished or unwritten by authors throughout time. Um, and so it has, you know, books from, you know, the ancient times right up to modern day. Um, and they're all books that are not completed books, but they're they're <laughs> embodiments of human imagination and human passion and um, and human interest, and that's what um, makes them powerful um, to demons. Um, and so this librarian, she she works in the library. She's the one in charge, um, and so she's in charge of maintaining this collection, um, and she gets. Um, sucked into a, a mystery um, where she has to hunt down this very powerful uh, manuscript that could um, potentially cause a war between heaven and hell. The author um, does justice to all the mythologies that she borrows from, um, but at the same time creates a very unique world. So would you say uh, if somebody liked um, Good Omens by Neil Gaiman, would they like this book? I think so. Yeah. That's yeah. When you were describing it, that's what I rem- that's what I envisioned, right? Yeah. Another author on the cover of the book um, that says, yeah, Shauna McGuire um, says that it's the Good Place, which is the TV show, um, mm-hmm. meets Law and Order Bibliophile Crime Unit. Um, and, um, it's, it's, that's a hundred percent accurate. Like, it's just a super fun, um, read that is like an adventure story, a little bit of a mystery story, a little bit of a fantasy story, um, all like mixed up and mashed together. So it's, yeah, it was super fun. It's not, I wouldn't say it's fluffy, but it definitely has that kind of like easy, fun, fluffy feel to it. Oh, that sounds great. I love that. It is now on my to be read list. Right? I find during the pandemic and everything, my brain is just not, it's hard for me to focus. So uh, sometimes I, I like to go back. Books. And, and you know, if it's a book you really liked, it's no different than watching a rerun on television. Like, how many times have I watched the same movie because I really liked the movie? It's no different. So the book that I'm currently rereading is called The Yard uh, by Alex Grecian. And I guess you can guess when it is set. It's, it's set during the Victorian era, and um, so it's right after the um, Jack the Ripper murders. <laughs> I know I'm on a theme. Anyway, so um, it's right after the Jack Ripper Jack the Ripper murders, and um, Scotland Yard is kind of like at a very low ebb because they never caught they never caught Jack the Ripper, and um, the public has no faith in them at all anyway so it um, it follows it's a series of books it's like five or six books in the series and and the yard is the first one and it's about um detective william day he's the main character him and his wife his wife is like a a high class a higher class um woman who has married down to marry him he's very aware of that he's aware that his her family doesn't think he's good enough for her and um, so he's always trying to prove himself and, uh, but he's like a super straight arrow. He's like really honest, very hardworking and, um, just a, like a general good guy. And he, the, he, the story starts off with a body has been discovered in a steamer trunk at train station. And so when they open it up, uh, this body has been compacted and put into the steamer trunk. And when they open it up, they realize that it's one of their own. It's one of uh, a detective from Scotland Yard who has been murdered and shoved into the steamer trunk. And all throughout the story, they're trying to find the killer who seems to be targeting 
uh, Scotland Yard detectives. And um, it's a really good book. Uh, Alex Christian does a really good job of of doing the, like the setting is really well described and it kind of puts you in that kind of like foggy, smoggy, dirty Victorian era city. So you like, you're, you really get into it when you read the book. Um, and the whole series is really well done. Um, and the reason I'm rereading it is because um, I never got to read the last book. So now I have to start at the beginning and go all the way through so I can read the last book because it's been so long since I read it. And uh, so now that's what I'm doing. I love rereading books. I love rereading books and uh, I love rereading series and getting to know all the characters all over again. And I always find like the first time you read it, um, you're so interested in the story that sometimes you miss things. Um, so the second time you read it, you always, you always pick up little bits of information that you missed the first time. Yeah, or like if you're watching, um, you know, a comedian and he's telling a joke and you're laughing and then he tells another joke, you miss it because you're laughing at the first joke he told. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> exactly. So what's your, what's your last book? So my last book is um, another fantasy book, and it's one that you have spent um, many, many times uh, recommending to me uh, over the years that we've known each other. Uh, because you know that, that I, this is another common thing that we share. Um, it's a bit of a fairy tale retelling esque type of book. Um, and you love those and you know that I also enjoy them. And so you've recommended this to me multiple times. Um, it's called Reckless by Cornelia Funk. I'm so glad you finally listened. <laughs> well, your recent video on our YouTube channel, the NLPL YouTube channel, where you talk about fairy tales for grownups. Um, you mentioned this book, and um, it inspired me because I needed a new audiobook. Um, I always, <laughs> I always have. I don't know if you have noticed, but I always have um, at least three books going on at the same time. One is always print, one is always an ebook, and one is always an audiobook. <laughs> you are nothing if not diplomatic. So I always have at least one of each type going on at the same time. Um, and so The Corner's Daughter was my print book, and The um, Library of the Unwritten was my ebook, um, and Reckless is my current audiobook read. I'm about halfway through, um, and it's, uh, it's a super fun read. I can totally see Yay. why you love it and why you recommended it to me so often. Um, the audiobook is narrated by Elliot Hill. And they do a really good job of bringing the, the story to life. Um, and the premise is that this um, this child, he's a child when he discovers it, but he, he becomes a man, obviously. Um, his name is Jacob Reckless, and he discovers a magic mirror in his father's study. Um, and it's a mirror where um, when you touch it a certain way, you enter into a fantasy realm um and in this fantasy realm um what cornelia funk has done is she has taken all of the fairy tales that you know all of the the stories that you remember from your childhood and she's built a fantasy world within them and around them um and it's its own unique world but every once in a while she'll she'll drop in a little Easter egg from a, uh, a fairy tale that you remember from your childhood, and That's I my find favorite them, part. I know, right? I find them so funny because you're you're so. I'm listening to this this book, and I'm just so engrossed in this world. And then she'll just drop in a mention of a glass slipper or <laughs> a princess that was put to sleep for a long time, and I'll start laughing because I'll be like, "Yeah, I remember that story." Or you'll come across a, a, a cottage in the woods and you're like, hmm, this one looks really familiar. <laughs> Is that gingerbread? I think so. Yeah. And the main character, Jacob, um, he is on a quest to save his brother who's being turned into one of the magical creatures that has that inhabits this realm. Um, he was injured, and when you're injured in this way, you turn into the creature that injured you. It's just a fun adventure fantasy story, and I can 100% understand why you love it and why you recommend it to me so often. <laughs> so you can smell it when you read it. <laughs> oh, yay. I'll have to find something else to put on your list now. <laughs> Definitely.
Well, this has been lots of fun, Christina. We got to do this again. And um, we plan on doing it once a month and getting together. And we promise not to share our books before we meet. Ooh, that's a good rule. Yes, not to share our books before we meet, and then that will make it nice and fresh for the conversation. And it was really weird that we had, like, similar books that we were reading at the same time. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com.